I'll never join you! If you only knew the power of the dark side. When I first saw the dialogue that said, Luke, I am your father, I said to myself, he's lying. I wonder how they're going to play that lie out. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. Say what? In the theater district where he was waiting. Mr. Jones. <laughs> David, how are you? What an honor. James Perfect. Earl Jones, whose voice is legendary. No, I am your father. Listen to this behind the scenes Action. moment. The voice of the actor who actually wore the Darth Vader suit. You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away. Then listen to James Earl Jones. You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away. About to turn 84, he's back on Broadway. You've been on Broadway many times before. I've been on Broadway some, but it's, it's so wonderful to be back on Broadway. This time performing in You Can't Take It With You, playing a wise grandfather. You have said before that it was your grandfather who had the most impact on you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my, my grandfather was, was Papa. He was a farmer, very simple man. A simple man who led the family and led his grandson, James Earl, through a challenging childhood. Your family didn't have a lot of money. No. During rationing time, we had some sugar. We, we hoarded away, and uh, we, we grew the rest of our food. But that wasn't his only hurdle. He was a boy who stuttered. He spent years not talking at all, until one day he wrote a poem in high school. There was a teacher who looked at one of your poems yeah. and said, this is so good, I want you to prove that you wrote this. Yeah. Do you remember standing up and reading that? Oh, yeah, and, and getting through it without stuttering. From poverty, from silence, a boy who would later excel. The fact that George Lucas chose your voice. That's an accident. You don't mind the accident now looking back, right? Oh, no, oh, no, I'm, I'm very proud to, be, to have been a part of that. The boy born in Mississippi and who grew up on a farm in Michigan ended up being the voice. And who was a stutterer. And yeah. Who, and who was a stutterer. That, that's his Darth Vader. So many iconic roles coming to America. Eva will come, Ray. Then that speech in, in Field of Dreams. So All these years later, ago, we study his caricature right there on the wall. Oh, Love and peace, James Earl Jones. I'm still the same person. Was the end yeah. on the wall? Yeah. And for this reporter begging for a lesson. Now listen, I do the news every night, and I, I can only dream of a voice with the kind of resonance that your voice has. Our voices are very similar, I'm afraid. You think so? Yeah, I, I have less control of mine, though. <laughs> you do? I'm serious. Really? And he revealed to me how he prepares before the fans arrive at that theater Every night. We yell. We yell at the seats. We oh, you yell at the empty seats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to practice that tonight before before the broadcast. And you make no the mistake, the they the were all seat. there for him. Thank you very much. An honor. An honor indeed. And so we choose James Earl Jones. And by the way, that 84th birthday comes in January, telling me he already has his next step planned, but said, I'm not revealing it. We can't wait. We'll see you for 2020 in just a few hours. And back here on Monday. Good night. I'll never join you. If you only knew the power of the dark side. When I first saw the dialogue that said, Luke, I am your father, I said to myself, he's lying. I wonder how they're going to play that lie out. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No. I Say what? South Africa, when they seem to be coming together, catches us as we seem to be coming apart. But I must emphasize seem. I don't think we're coming apart. But a lot of things are going on that has to do with pus, pus from wounds uh, that have been happening lately. And, uh, and sort of a, a rage that's undefined and un, un, has, has, has no direction, you know. And we're making a lot, a lot of mistakes in that so-called rage. I think rage is a, is, is a noble emotion. This is something else that's a bit of uh, psychosis, I think, you know. The psychosis that America feels in terms of... Well, you know, I, 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 I did a speech at, uh, at uh, the Harp, at, at, at the Yale um, Political Union recently, yeah. <laughs> and I tried to compare the militia, uh, the right-wing militia, right. to the old um, 
weathermen, the old left-wing uh, militant groups. In the 60s. And, 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 and to imply that they all germinated from the same seed of discontent, you know. And that, 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 that sort of discontent, I think, is, is, uh, is festering now. A notion that there's no way that I can legitimately change the society that I think is wrong, and so therefore I have to find well, some extra-legal means. When blue-eyed, blonde uh, Tim McVeigh finds there's no hope for him, I mean, he, he was supposed to inherit all the best that was America. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and when he when, he's, when he feels hopeless, then so, we got to pay attention to what's going on. But that that's I call that pus. That that's unresolved pain, unresolved uh, anger, you know. And uh, but I think aside from that, we, we, we're moving ahead. And, and we, uh, where do you see li hope? like South Africa? Oh, well, it's all. I'll come back to it's South awful. Africa, but stay in the United it's States. Awful. I just saw uh, last night. I happened to see Elie Wiesel, who just returned from Japan, and he said they had he chaired a thing where they had a group of Nobel laureates talking about where is the hope in the world today. Where do you see the hope in America to heal whatever the pus is, whatever the conflict is, especially between have and have not and between black and white? Uh, I, I walk out the door and there's a guy deliver, delivering mail every day without complaint. He's got a job. He's, he, he, respects his job, you know, and he might not ever be president, but he, he's participating in society, uh, not earning a lot of money, he's in, but he's not, not selling crack, you know. Mm -hmm. And I say, that, that's the hope. And, and the simple people that go about their lives, and that's the majority of the people, yeah. go about their lives. And, uh, Simply and wanting them. yeah, they have needs and, and they're wanting. Food, shelter, not, education for their children, and a better life. A better life, yeah, yeah. yeah not an extraordinary life, any just a better life. life. Those in Bosnia, those in... Uh, Somalia, those, you know, uh, in South Africa, yeah. yeah. And South Africa has the same problems that they had before, before, before the democracy, but at least now the problems are better to be solved rather than ignored, you know. There is a line that your character, I think, speaks in the film in which she says, I have a great fear in my heart while whites, and help me with this, while whites find love in their hearts, the blacks will have already turned to hate. Uh, that has happened to some extent here, uh, and I call that the psychosis, where, where racism, racism is contagious, and blacks have always said, we, we're not racist, but uh, I'm sorry, we are. And, uh, and that is a form of insanity. And in South Africa, though, you had young people who were burning down schools and burning, burning books, and uh, for uh, real reasons, because apartheid schools and books were teaching how to accommodate apartheid, mm -hmm. how to live with it, how to accept it. And they, they should have burned those books in, in the school. But now Mandela has to get them to revere education again and to, uh, to, to use that as a tool for advancing their lives for a better way of life. We have the same problem here. There is young black people saying, well, to get an education to talk straight is acting white. You know, uh, The stupidest thing where you can throw away, the only tool you have, uh, because uh, um, um, without that, there's no way to advance. What responsibility do you feel with a, a good brain and a powerful voice and a strong presence mm. to somehow reach out to those young? No, I have to do it in my work. I can't do it as a politician or, or an activist. I don't do that well. Probably because I, I don't, I don't, uh, I can have a conversation with you that might be meaningful, might be, you know, hot air, I don't know, but, but I, I can't do that in public. Uh, I, can, I can't hold forth, I can't, I'm not facile with words. I can do other people's writing, you know. Yeah. I, I can do uh, Alan Payton's writing. <laughs> I have a few guys writing. You, you, could have read this, you could have read this script a lot better than I could. <laughs> Is that why you were laughing at me no, when I, I, I tried it the first time? I love time? your energy, <laughs> which, which is a part of it, you know. It, 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 uh, Kick it off, you know. <laughs> yeah, I sort of boomed out here, James yeah. Earl Jones. <laughs> I mean, your voice is is. I mean, you and few people have this great base. I mean, not many people are. Were you born with that? Um, one can train in, in opera, sure. of course. They do train for it, but I think the the, the natural base is, is quite rare in society. I know of only four people: Paul Robeson, my father, Jeffrey Holder, and myself. Yeah. And now, there are other people, of course, and I'm, I'm talking about yeah. the, the black guys, you know. Your father knew Paul Robes. Yeah, he did, yeah, yeah. And that influenced you to become an actor? Well, I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I took the name Todd uh, Jones after the name, yeah. uh, after uh, Todd Duncan, who was a, yeah. 
Uh, Stig, uh, was your dad's name Robert Earl? Robert Earl. Robert Earl. Yeah, yeah, he is. Robert he is Robert Earl. Earl. He's still, he's he's still, still acts. He, yeah. he ran the Manhattan Marathon uh, yeah. a, few, a few weeks How old ago. Is he? He's 86. And he ran in the marathon? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, he's, uh, and he still has that booming voice? Oh, yeah. 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 Robeson was a hero. Yes. I think the most committed human being that ever lived. I, I discovered another one uh, in, in Vernon Johns and someone I did not know about. You before. played his life. It was we, a minister. We, we played at it. We played a bit of it, yeah. But I think that, that story has yet to be explored. And uh, there's some wonderful sermons that he wrote, and one that's, that's yeah, been yeah. recorded is uh, the romance of death. That is, the man believed in education. He believed, he believed that he, he learned uh, Greek and Latin even before, before school. And, uh, and he challenged all of us. Uh, what did he say in that sermon, the romance of death? About uh, not just accepting death, but... Uh, but uh, seeing it as the end of a great life. Yeah. You've got to have a great life before you die, you know. Somehow, yeah. you have to bring something to the world. He, he, he felt that if you didn't contribute, didn't produce something in the world, you were a parasite. And uh, it bothered a lot, a lot of black people. Because yeah. they, they had gotten, you know, through Tuskegee, and they had gotten through, got, got their degrees, and they were teaching in colleges. And he said, no, you've got to do more. You've got you to produce. So he, um, uh, he, he was dumped uh, with, with the idea that they, they would take on young Martin yeah. Luther King, and, uh, who was more malleable, they thought. You know, right. That is the, the next Avenue uh, Baptist yeah. Church. Didn't turn out to be that way, but <laughs> yeah. He lived to what age, Vernon? Vernon John. Uh, I, I don't know the age he was. Yeah. He, he gave did, us, he, um, did he live to see the Civil Rights Revolution? <clears throat> Yes, accomplished he, he, the goals he, he, accomplished he, he, in terms oh, yes, of the he, civil rights he, he, legislation. He lived to see, he lived to see uh, the media catch on to the drama yeah. of that movement, yeah. you know, with Martin and, and, and the bus boycott and Rosa Parks. Uh, but he, he, he had by then stepped aside. He was yeah. kind of a uh, bohemian, you know. He would yeah. get on the road and almost undercover. He, he, he wore raggedy clothes. And, but when he dressed up, he was a very handsome, glamorous yeah. man, you know. Yeah. And, uh, one of your favorite roles? Yeah, well, one of my favorite people. I, I, yeah, want, people. I want to know him better. He made me understand Christianity in a way that I never understood. What before. did you understand from what he taught you about it? Well, in that sermon, it, it, it's a bit, bit complicated. I'd rather, I'd rather okay. read, but it basically, read the sermon uh, someday. But he taught you about faith? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Real faith. And, and how, how one participates in life, uh, and not just in the name of Christ, but in the name of mankind, in the name of... Yeah. The name of uh, Let me turn back to Alan Patton and Cry the Beloved yeah. Country. Uh, the book is about forgiveness, is it not? It is the story... It, that, that is a theme that, that evolves out of it. It is about two men and, uh, who both lose a son. And uh, the, the, the black father discovers that his son is corrupt, and he destroys uh, the son of a, a white bigot. An African. And the white bigot, he, he's English, really. Right. Uh, the white bigot discovers that his son was a hero, well, was a good man. And the irony is that my son would kill his son. That weighs on uh, Stephen Kamala, the, the, okay. the, the priest, uh, very heavily. So when they confront each other, He's really in need of forgiveness as much as um, the need to, gi to give forget forgiveness, you know. Richard Harris plays Jarvis. Yeah. I, I made sure that I didn't get to know Richard until that scene was over. Why? I, mean, I didn't want to become too comfortable with him, you know. Because I, it would... That comfort would have uh, left the edges uh, not as raw as they, they should be. I mean, I had to confront that man as if I didn't know whether he was going to kill me or hug me. And because he no knew that. that your son had killed yeah, his son. Yeah. Cause and I need more than, than he does. And I need forgiveness. Why do you need forgiveness? Stephen Kamalo, a Zulu, right. but an Ang Anglican priest, was a very simple man. He, and that I understand. He was a rural person with none of the sophistication or, or political awareness. Peyton did a very interesting thing. He gave, he gave uh, Stephen Kamalo a brother, John Kamalo, who was very hip, very aware, and very activist, you know. And uh, so he didn't have to compromise either character. He could leave them both as prototypes at each end of the pole. And uh, 
the young priest, which was the Sidney Poitier role in the other film. That, yeah. uh, when black and white. Yeah, yeah. Great film, by the way. <clears throat> they all they all they lack is a is it's a Jarvis, which we have in, in Richard Harris. You, know. you thought that they ought to be seen together, almost. So. Oh, I wish they could. Yeah. Uh, almost in tandem. That, that, that's like a school project, sure. I guess. You know. Uh, but it could be very entertaining as well to see see them not in, not in contrast, but. It, but in in in, uh, in support of each other. Sidney did not play the character you played. Um, he played the young priest. He played the young priest, John. who uh, has a foot in both camps: the the camp of peace and the camp of activism as well. You know? yeah. How is your characterization of Stephen Fumalo different than was it Canada that played him? Canada Lee, yes. Canada Lee. He was a stalwart oak. A stalwart oak. A stalwart oak. Uh, 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 as glorious as Sydney was, it, it's, that, that stalwart was, was, was Canada. And I knew I couldn't bring that to it, but I, I, I was in touch with the simplicity that I know from my, my people in Mississippi and Michigan, the farming people. Um, I mean, my first visit to a city was at the age of 14, I got mugged every day and didn't know what it was. You know, that's how green and unaware I was. What did you think it was? Well, some other this is the guys way they behave here. Money. That's yeah, okay. all. And I yeah. gave them the money. I, the idea of fighting over it mm. that never occurred to me. And, and I guess that's what saved my life. Or, but yeah. then it was not as dangerous to get mugged in those days as it, as it is now. But um, that, that unawareness and that, that lack of any, any, any defense against what the urban world can dump on you, which includes degradation and not just racism, but all the harsh things that, that happen. In, in, and I guess Alan Payton was a bit anti-urban in a way. Mm. This he book was that. written in 1946 or eight, wasn't yeah, it? But yeah, but it was. Yeah, it's set in 1946, yeah. two years before apartheid became official. Yeah. So when he wrote it, he did not know that apartheid had come to an end. Had oh, no way. He of probably it. knew. He, he was very active uh, with the Liberal Party. He, he, he established it, didn't he? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think he represents. Uh, he in, in the movie, he is the uh, the Evans character. Yeah. Very dedicated and for good man. Very dedicated to helping the youth. In, in, their, in their troubled times, you know. Yeah. The book was an instant classic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, people yeah. all over the world said yeah. this was their first view and understanding yeah. of how awful. It was pre-apartheid. You know, and it, pre -what it, it doesn't show the horror of it so much as it shows the, the, the simple reality of it, how mundane yeah. racism is, how, how easy it is for the Chavez to... Oh, man, they live in their world, we live in ours. It's so easy. That's the worst kind of racism, is the easy racism. Kind of you benign neglect. Grand, yeah. Worse than that, it's just sort of, uh, sort of a dumb kind of a... Uh, and that's... Uh, I, what he knew, uh, um, he, he, um, he, his, his, his story preceded uh, apartheid by two years. I think he knew. Um, uh, I think uh, it was around that time that well, didn't, didn't Smuts have a, a campaign to bring in uh, one man, one vote? Mm -hmm. And that terrified the right wing so much that they, they really marshaled the, the energies and all the guys that and had been codified and enshrined during and, World yeah. War II yes. all came together. When you went there to make this film, uh, what impact did being there and making this film and walking with the people of South Africa have on you? Well, uh, I, I tried to reserve judgment. Um, uh, the first thing that hit me was the uh, the infrastructure that had been left there. That is, you know, part of the legacy of the the English and the, and the Dutch. You know, the, uh, quite quite impressed by the architecture, the efficiency of the roads, 